Yeah, so in this video we are now talking about the bias variance decomposition, at least giving a brief introduction to the bias and variance decomposition. So the last video ended with a question, what does it mean if we say the model has high bias and high variance? And if you read other research articles or blog posts or textbooks, you will find that very often people say a model has high bias or a model has high variance. So we are currently now in the process of dissecting it, what, what it means. Yeah, and we will do that by looking at the so-called bias variance decomposition. And there's also the so-called bias variance trade-off. Uh, and then later in a later video, we will see how that relates to overfitting and underfitting, which are a little bit more intuitive um, to talk about. Yeah, so what is the bias variance decomposition? So it's a com decomposition of the loss into two terms, into the bias and variance. Actually, there's a third term, the noise term, but we will not look at the noise term explicitly in this lecture for simplicity. So here we are going to focus on decomposing a loss, for example, the squared error or the zero one loss into a bias and the variance term. And that helps us understanding machine learning algorithms, but also then how it relates to underfitting and overfitting of a model. And in the context of last lecture, where we talked about ensemble methods, it can also help us to better understand why they perform better than single models. So for example, bagging reduces the variance compared to a single model and boosting may yeah, decrease the bias uh, in compared to a single model. So both bagging and boosting kind of manipulate uh, how bias and variance behave compared to the single decision tree models um, used in the ensemble. So when people say in practice a model has high bias, this usually refers to the bias of the loss. And when people say a model has high variance, that usually refers to the variance of the loss. So what are bias and variance again? So this is the figure we already looked at uh, when we talked about the ensemble methods briefly. So here, um, this is just summarizing the different scenarios where we can have a low variance and a low bias. This means that we usually make a very accurate prediction. So there's an, a very small error term. So the outputs are not very scattered and they're also very much on target where the center here is ideal. It's like the bullseye when you're playing darts you can have a low bias. Also, when you average it, you are still correct, but then you can have a high variance where um, all the estimates are very scattered. And um, yeah, a very bad case if you, is if you have a high bias and a high variance. So not only are your estimates very scattered, but also they are very far off from the center. And then the fourth possibility is having a high bias and a low variance. It's also not very ideal because um, yeah, the estimates will be very consistent, but they will also be far off from the correct value. So let me now, to illustrate this, redraw some of the figures I showed you in the ensemble method lecture. So assume there is some true underlying data generating function f of x. And this is, um, think of it as a natural phenomenon. This is just something that generates our data. That's some true phenomenon or function. But in practice, um, yeah, there's usually some noise also. So uh, in blue, you can think of the dots as the real data points that can be observed. Let's say that can be measured by some device. So if the target, the true underlying function is, let's say the temperature at, at some point, then the blue points would be like the actual measurements that we can make with thermometers, for example. So there's usually some noise term, the noise in the measurement. And in practice, usually we also only have a subset of the population. So we don't have all the data points, the whole population. We only have subsets. So we have training sets that are usually, of course, smaller than the population. So here on the right hand side, I have three possible training sets. So train set one, train set two and train set three. And they're just random samples from the population here, the blue points. So I just randomly sampled from them. So we have these three possible training sets. And you can see they are relatively different from each other, even though they come from the same population or the data generating function. So here I plotted linear regression models that were fit to either training set one, training set two and training set three. So the blue line is a linear regression model fit on training set one. The orange line is 
a linear regression model to fit to training set two. And the green line is a linear regression model fit to training set three. So this would be a case where we have a high bias model. And the reason is that we are for all these three models, we are very far off from the true target function, the data generating function. So our, if we would make uh, predictions with these uh, linear regression models, the predictions would be obviously very bad if based on the x value, our task is to predict these um, y values on the y axis, the true values here. So given these models, um, that would be a high bias scenario. However, the bias in some points is actually very low. So or zero, and this is where the model does make a correct prediction. So let me use maybe the color red here. So there are some points where the model would actually make correct predictions, right? So if we give it, or every of these models, if we give them an X value of five, it would actually make the correct prediction here. So this one would actually be a good prediction. So here the bias is zero, but everywhere else, I mean, most of the data points, the whole range here is really far off from the true function. So this would be a high um, bias model. And also in some regions here, there would be a high variance because as the training set varies, we also see the models might be very different. So let's maybe take a closer look at the high variance case. So here I fit an unpruned decision tree. So this has a high variance and that is because um, if we have different data sets, it would significantly affect the model. So um, having different training sets, even though they are from the same population, um, if it causes the model to be very different, then we would have a high variance. So the predictions would be very scattered depending on how the training set looks like, even though all the training sets are from the same population. Maybe also to just jump back by one slide. So this would be a region where the models or the model predictions are very robust to the different training sets. So here the um, predictions are very consistent. So this would be a low variance case because the model predictions are very consistent. Here it would be more scattered. If we have a more complex model, a model that is more complex than a linear regression model, here an unpruned decision tree for regression, then um, this would fit the data very, very closely, right? And if the training set just changes a little bit, the model would look very different. So here I have three unpruned decision trees and you can see all the three models are very different. So this would be a high variance case. So unpruned decision trees have high variance, whereas linear regression models usually uh, have high bias on nonlinear data sets. So what happens now if we take the average? So if we take the model average, that would be um, yeah, an ensemble method where we just average the model predictions. So if we take the average here on the left hand side, we can see actually that the average is a little bit closer to the true function than each of the individual models. It's a little bit hard to see here on the left hand side. I mean, it's a very, very small data set and we only have three models where we are averaging. So on the right hand side, I'm overlaying the average with the other models and you can see roughly that the red line here, the average of the three models is actually uh, closer to the true function than any of the other models. So we are here reducing the variance by averaging over these high variance models, which is kind of like what begging does, right? Yeah, so that was um, the intuition behind bias and variance. Now we are going to talk about some of the terminology that we will use when we are, um, we are going to define bias and variance more formally and then also do the bias and variance decomposition. So um, we will use the term point estimator or theta hat, uh, which basically is um, yeah, a function that is used to find an approximate value of a population parameter using the data, using samples or training examples. So this is some true parameter that we want to estimate. And this is our, yeah, basically our approximation of that. So then we can define the bias as follows. So the bias is then here, the expectation of theta hat minus the true parameter. So this is um, the expectation. You can also think of it as averaging. So if we are averaging over all the estimators, the point estimators, and subtract them from the true parameter, that is our bias term.
So yeah, that was the definition of the bias term. Now we can also express the variance term as follows. So here we have the point estimator squared, which gets rid of the negative values. And then the expectation of that minus the expectation of the point estimator, same term as here, but also now squared. And then subtracting these from each other. Um, I find it personally easier to understand the variance if we rewrite it as follows. So we can rewrite it as follows, where we have the expectation of the point estimator minus the point estimator, let's say for, for one model. Um, so if you take a look at this, there's a square term to get rid of the negative values. So this can be done many times. So for example, for all training data sets. So imagine you have changing uh, training data sets. And then if you would take the expectation of that, that would be our variance term. So in other words, this term, it kind of um, yeah, gives us how, how far the average point estimator is away from a particular point estimator. So it's basically giving us the idea of how spread these um, point estimators R. or here in a more visual way. So I was drawing this little person here, shooting um, arrows using a little bow here. And the variance would be basically how scattered these arrows are when they land. So how far they are away from each other. The higher the variance, the more the farther um, scattered these are. And let's say here's, here's our target that we want to hit. And the distance from the target, this is our bias, right? So the target, you can think of it as my theta here. And the distance here is between the average. So if we take a look at the average here, minus the distance to the target, that would be our, our bias here. And for the variance, you can think of each of these lines as a theta hat, and then we are subtracting it from the average. So we are um, checking how far if um, this is our average, so how far they are scattered, and then the average of how far each um, point estimator is away from the um, average of the point estimators. It's this term. So if we take a look at the average of the scatter, that is then our variance term. In practice, there's also some noise, but for simplicity in this lecture, we are ignoring the noise. So the noise would be about the target. So the target could be also a little bit um, uncertain. So we could have some um, noise. So that is something we will ignore though in this following uh, slides to keep things more simple. So yeah, here I'm also um, recapping this. So the bias is the difference between the average estimator from different training samples. So training sample here means training set. So if we have different training sets, uh, like I was showing you earlier, the bias is the difference between the prediction for a certain data point on that data set, averaged over multiple training sets, and then minus the true value that we want to predict. So if we uh, think back of, oops. So if we think back of the case where we had this true function here. And let's say we want to predict um, this uh, y value belonging to a particular x value here. Then um, depending on what training set we use, we may be um, off by certain points. So if we have the green data set and we fit a model to that, the prediction might be, um, let's say here, maybe for a different data set, if we fit the, fit the model, prediction may be here. And for another data set, it might be here. So if we then consider the average of these, so the average of these three points might be the center here, how far is it away from the true value, which is down here? So that would be the bias term. So the expectation is over the training sets. And the variance provides an estimate of how much the estimates vary as we vary the training data. So for example, by resampling, and again, this is um, when we have our case here, we want to make a prediction we want to make the y prediction for a given x 
and the variance tells us if we have three model predictions that are like this, it tells us how spread out they are from each other. Okay, so we are now doing the bias variance decomposition of the squared error loss, ignoring the noise term. So for simplicity, we will ignore the noise term and just focus on bias and variance. And that is what we are going to do in the next video for the squared error. Then we will take a look at how that relates to overfitting and underfitting. And lastly, we will then also do the bias variance decomposition of the zero one loss.